everyone welcome to island uplift history class this is episode two and in today's episode we will be focusing on looking at the indigenous people groups that were present in the caribbean at the time of the arrival of the spanish in the year 1492 so today we'll be looking at the mayans the taino and the kalinago but first we want to go through some points of clarity and correction from our last episode which was episode one now first thing is that there is frequent debate over whether initial movement into the Caribbean actually started from Central America or if it started from South America. However, they just wanna point out that the evidence does point more to movement first occurring from Central America into Cuba. In any case, it's very important to note that the movement from Mesoamerica or Central America into Cuba, as well as the movement from South America into Trinidad and then to the rest of the islands, those two movements were considered the initial migratory movements into the Caribbean region by these indigenous people groups, all right? Now, the second point of clarity is this, and it's concerning the persons who occupy the lowland forested areas of Venezuela and Guyana. Remember, we spoke about those persons. So the first inhabitants of South America, they would have initially occupied the Western lands, primarily the Andean mountain range in the Western coast um, of the South American continent. And these people, while living in the Andean mountain range, they would have hunted animals such as the woolly mammoth, the mastodon, the ground slot. However, when these animals became extinct, they then started to hunt the ancestors of the modern day llama and alpaca. But when those ancestors of the llama and the alpaca became extinct as well, they started to move. So as the game animals that they hunted became extinct over many years, these people groups would have moved from the Western lands of the Andes um, to the lower forested lands in Northern South America. All right, so those are some points of clarity there. So this is actually one of the major ways that people groups who migrated to these lowland forested areas, this is one of the major ways that they actually made their way to these forested areas. So I just wanted to correct and clarify that. All right, so let's get into it. Now, these before you here, and I'm just gonna go through them here, are the main objectives that you are required to know when looking at the Mayans, the Taino, and the Kalinago. However, when you read the objectives, especially in your CSEC syllabus, you realize it's a bit difficult. So what I'll do, I'll simplify it a bit. So if when you're studying this, for each group, the Mayan, the Taino, and the Kalinago, we will study them using the following format. For each of them, we will look at their social and political structure, we will look at their religious beliefs, we will look at their economic practices and patterns, and then we will look at their art forms, science and technology. All right, and this will help us to really cover those objectives that are required. All right, so let's go into it. So the first people group that we're going to look at are the Mayans, the Mayans, all right, our Mesoamerican um brethren we're gonna look at them right now so let's get into it first of all we're gonna look at their social and political structure now the mayan civilization they had a unique political structure all right it was pretty unique because instead of one central government and one supreme leader ruling over all the, the civilization was made up of several what we call city states and this is very interesting now, each city-state was ruled by a king who was called the Halak Unique. Um, he was called the Halak Unique, meaning the real man. He was also referred to as the Aha, and you realize that Aha is spelled differently based on whatever source you're reading. Sometimes you might see it spelled A-H-A-W or A-H-A-U, but Aha means he is lord or ruler, and he was also seen as the high priest, all right? Now, each city that the Halak Unique ruled over was comprised of a central city and ceremonial area, as well as several surrounding villages. And each of these villages, they were ruled by someone called a Batab, which was a lower level chief who was accountable to the Halak Unique, 
So this is a diagram showing the Mayan social structure. So at the top, we have the Halak Unique, who was basically the person who was in charge of that city-state. Then we had the Batabs, who were like lower level chiefs. Then we had the priesthood, all right? And then we have the Papoms, right, which were merchants and traders. Then we had peasants, right, who were the basic lay, lay persons who were doing manual labor and so on. And then the lowest tier, the lowest tier in the Mayan social structure was slaves. And most of these slaves were children and were prisoners and also criminals who were forced to do what we know as grunt work, like grinding maize and chopping trees and so on. And they were, they, they were not poorly treated, but <laughs> they were usually killed and buried with their master when the master died. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, for the Mayan civilization, at its zenith point... It would have had over 40 city-states, and each of them would have had a population of between five and 50,000 people. That's a lot. All right, that's a lot. For, for that day, that was really a lot. The civilization had a population of over 2 million, most of which lived in the lowland areas of modern-day Guatemala. And the main city-states were Uaxacton, Copan, Bonampak, Tikal, Palenque, and Rio Beck. All right. Now, these are just some examples. You don't necessarily have to memorize these names, but it'd be cool if you do. All right. Now, the houses of the ordinary Mayan, they were actually small and simple. The ordinary people would have lived on the outskirts of the temple in the main city area, and they would have only gone to the city to worship and buy food. Now, Maya of greater nobility, and this is the difference here, all right? Maya of greater nobility, they lived in houses made from sculpted stone, especially limestone, because that was the prevalent mineral that was, that was present in the geography of the Mayan civilization. All right, now Maya men usually had one wife and they would also have their concubines as well. And they frequently had ball coats for recreational and ceremonial purposes. Now, interestingly, the concept of a ball coat is something that you would see prevalent among Mesoamerican and even Amerindian people groups. It's very interesting that this ball coat concept, all right? So we want to look at religious beliefs of the Mayan civilization. Now, first of all, the Mayan, they were seen as polyistic people, meaning they believed in more than one God. As a matter of fact, they had over 166 gods, each of whom would have either been good or bad. Now, such gods include the Hunabku, who was seen as the chief god, the Kinik Ahau, who was seen as the sun god, Shak, who was seen as the rain god, Yomkax, the corn or maize god, and Akinchil, who was seen as the god of the earth. Once again, you don't necessarily remember these names. Interestingly, though, Hunabku was a terminology that was used frequently especially after the christianization that would have occurred when the spanish interacted with a lot of the mesoamericans all right but of course that's for another time that's for another topic now religious rules and ceremonies they were overseen and conducted by the priests who were called the akin now the akin would they would set and organize festivals they would make sacrifices they would organize the auspicious days on the mayan calendar for planting and harvesting and this is a famous one they would conduct not just sacrifices but human sacrifices now fun fact and we'll get to the human sacrifices part in a while the Mayan worship a god who was called Gukumats, and he was seen as one of 13 deities who created the earth and human beings. As a matter of fact, different sects of the people groups uh, of the Mayan civilization, they actually had different ideas as to the, creation, uh, to the creation story. But most Mayans, especially those who are Yucatan Mayans, they would have believed in the concept of 13 deities that came together to form the earth and human beings. Now, the god that they worship, 
known as Gukumats. He was known as Gukumats by the Kiche Maya people, and he was known as Kukulkan by the Yucatec Maya people. Now, the reason why I mentioned this particular god is because he is also worshipped by a whole other civilization, the Aztecs. But instead of Kukulkan, they call him Quetzalcoatl, right? Meaning the plume serpent or the Quetzal feathered serpent. Now, when we take a look at the Aztecs in the future, we will explain more about the whole story and the folklore and so on surrounding Quetzalcoatl. All right. Interestingly, it has something major, major to do with the flag of Mexico, the emblem on the flag of Mexico. But that's all I'll say. And you can even research it if you want. All right. Now, the Mayans, now remember we spoke about the ball code, they would have practiced a game called Pokatuk. Now, Pokatuk was a ceremonial game and it was used to represent um, like a battle between good and versus evil it was played by trying to pass a ball through you had like an open court and you had these stone rings and you had to pass the ball through the stone ring you could have even gotten extra points based on how or where the ball hit the ring now it was very hard to get the ball through the ring and if you didn't if you did pass the ball through it means you automatically win the race. The, only, the other thing is you couldn't use like your hands, but when playing poker talk, I think you had to use your hips or something like that, your pelvic region, right? Now, interestingly, this was a ceremonial game and it was used to represent so many things, all right? Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes the losers of these games would have actually been used as human sacrifices all right and this is an interesting part in looking at the mayans now i remember looking at this movie apocalypto now apocalypto is probably one of the best if not the best cinematic depictions of a mesoamerican civilization so of course you know in apocalypto and in case you might not know but it's a 2006 movie that was directed by mel gibson and it features um the story of a young mesoamerican uh hunter gatherer by the name of jaguar pa and his family of course they were invaded by the mayans the mayans took them as slave but jaguar pa actually found a way to hide his pregnant wife somewhere safe while they took them away they took them away because they wanted slaves and they also wanted human sacrifices to appease the mayan gods it, but if you look at the movie you'll see the interesting things that happen with jaguar pond so this is a particular scene where they're in a mayan city and they're holding down one of the persons that they took captive and they were gonna um, sacrifice the person by cutting into their chest and pulling out their heart. All right. So this was actually a very interesting and it's even proven to be very accurate depiction of the Mayan civilization and how they would have gone about doing things. So you should really sh check it out. It's a very, very interesting movie. All right. So we want to look at the economic practices and patterns of the Mayan people groups. Now, firstly, the Mayan economy, it was based on agriculture, but it was not based on kun, kunu, <laughs> um, cultivation. And this involved growing root crops on like these small plots of land, but like their raised dirt beds. Um, that their small plots of land that look like raised dirt beds, and they would have frequent crop rotations. Um, on these where they would grow different root crops all year round so that you could always have a root crop available. The Mayans did not practice Kanuko um, cultivation, all right? The main crop that they grew was maize or corn. So as a result, they didn't really have much um, crop rotation because they would have grown this produce, this corn in like in massive amounts, all right? Now, the Maya relied heavily on agriculture, and they like, relied heavily on agriculture, even more than the Taino and the Kalinago people. And they had a 
big market economy, meaning they traded many goods such as cotton, textile, ceramics, food, and even good, gold, gold, sorry. And they were not nomadic or heavily migratory. Instead, they were people who tended to settle in a particular area and then they would develop in that area and they would build advanced cities and these cities would be comprised of ceremonial, residential and commercial structures and areas. Now, fun fact, the Mayans actually used the cacao beans, which I used to make chocolate as money. And you would realize that they're actually the only one of the three um, indigenous people groups that we're looking at that actually had a form of currency. All right. So that was very, very interesting. <clears throat> and then we have their art forms, their science and their technology. Now, most of their art and craft was made from wood, jade, very interesting, copper and gold this includes tools weapons and even the cutting of limestone now they wore boldly patterned clothing so they were very pretty <laughs> right with headdresses made from both feathers now it was a very in thing back in those days to have headdresses that would have featured the feathers of the quetzal bird and even when we look at the aztecs in the future you would realize that the quetzal bird holds heavy significance to mesoamerica people. Uh, their paintings, they were usually done by dyes obtained from berries of the anato shrub and also the fruit of the genipa tree. All right. So they're very colorful people. Now, the thing is they lived in round or rectangular huts with a central wooden pool. And this setup, it supported what we call a conical touch roof. And I'm going to show you a picture in a moment, right? And these huts, they had woven reeds, but they didn't have any windows. Now, Maya nobility didn't really live in these kind of huts. Instead, they lived in limestone houses. And a Maya city, it contained one or more plazas or squares surrounded by pyramids. And these um, stone-like structures or pillars called stele, all right? And stele were kind of used as like methods of, of, um, of relaying a story or giving information, like communication. So a lot of what we know about the Maya civilization would have been as a result of information that archaeologists found on these huge pillars called stele. So they were very important. Now, temples... When the Mayans built these pyramids, right, temples were located on top of the pyramids. The pyramids were made out of rubble and uh, limestone blocks, but the temples themselves on top of the pyramids, they were, they consisted of very thick walls and, and it was very intrinsic masonry. So it was very, very good. Remember, these were the areas they had the sacrifices and so on. So they wanted to ensure that everything was level here. If you understand, you don't want to just build your temples any anyhow you want them to be properly done. All right. Now, the Mayans, they were very advanced in their writing and their mathematical skills. And they had a hieroglyphic system of writing, which consisted of over 850 characters. Imagine that. That is very intrinsic. All right. And they began writing. Now, this is how they began. They began writing merely on tree bark, but then as time progressed, they started writing on the same um, stone pillars, the stele, as well as pottery and ornaments. So that's progression right there for you. And their most famous work is the Mayan calendar. All right. You remember when persons used to think something catastrophic was going to happen in the year 2012. That was because they were doing it based off of the Mayan calendar, which is actually very accurate, by the way. Now, it involved actually revolving interlocking circles and it showed a well-developed knowledge of astronomy. You realize that a lot of civilizations in those days and even when you look i know we're doing caribbean history but even when you look in the fertile crescent the babylonians and the assyrians and phoenicians and 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 all these different people groups they and the medes and the persians as well which came much later uh well came right after the babylonians sorry they were very much into the astronomy 
and they knew how to read the stars and and even different greek scientists and so on were able to calculate the circumference of the earth so correctly thousands of years or many years before more advanced mathematicians as we might see them were able to actually use more advanced devices to 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 calculate these things it's so amazing it is so amazing so the mayans they were very advanced mathematically and technological wise so this is a depiction of mayan clothing and mayan appearance we also see a picture here of stealing the stone pillars that they used to communicate so this is just a very good imagery to show you how they look and then now we have some mayan structures now in the top right hand corner here we have one of the regular mayan huts remember this is where they were either circular or rectangular and if you look in the bottom right hand corner you would see that pole that was usually in the middle especially if it was circular that would have acted as the main support system but of course, on your left hand side now, you would see the pyramids that were built with the temple that was located at the top of the pyramid. And this now is a very interesting one where we have the Mayan number system. So remember, they were advanced mathematically and they developed this number system where, for example, a zero was a shell, a dot and a shell was 20, right? So you see one dot was one, two dots was two, three dots was three, four dots was four, and then a single drawn line now represented um, five. So that's pretty interesting. So you can pause and look at it, check it out. And yeah, that's pretty cool. And of course, this is a visual representation of the Mayan calendar. All right, it has a lot of different things that you could turn and twist and so on to to see what is happening to to measure different things and and as persons used to say to even predict certain events you know but it was actually very accurate it was actually a very accurate calendar some even state that it was even more accurate than the gregorian calendar that we use today mm -hmm.